I'm Debbie Fox Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of HD Reach. And I want to start off by saying the very first thing I want to do is to say something to all of our frontline medical providers who are participants in this uh, panel and also in the audience, and just to let everyone know how grateful we all are for helping to keep everyone well. Um, I, before we get started, I do want to just do a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, we want to hear your questions, so please submit them using the chat button. And we have our fearless chat moderator, Heather Burns, who will read your questions during the live Q&A portion. Also, we'll, everybody will only be able to see and hear the panel participants. Now, are you ready to get some great ideas on how to live well with HD uh, during a pandemic? And so, um, you know, life has a fun way of sending us some interesting challenges. And that's what this conference is all about, is learning how to um, overcome these challenges. And so we've put together a great panel of experts who are gonna give their best advice on adjustments that you can all make to make life easier right now. And after I ask them a few rounds of questions, we're gonna open them up to your questions. Um, so go ahead and submit your questions using the chat feature. And then after this live session is over, you can start watching each of the 30 to 45 minute recorded seminars. These seminars answer all the questions that people who are at the various stages of HD have uh, for people who are at risk for HD or for someone who is caring for someone with HD. When watching the seminar, you can always ask a question by filling out the question form or by calling HD Reach. And if you're not familiar with HD Reach, we are a nonprofit group ded dedicated to working with families who are impacted by HD. We connect families to local resources in North Carolina, and we work with families remotely to help find solutions for HD issues. At the end of this presentation, I hope you will fill out a really short three question survey to let us know if this is helpful because we really want your feedback. Now, I'd like to start by asking each member of the panel to introduce themselves and share one thing from their perspective of their discipline that they think is most important for living well with HD. And Allison Bartlett, I'm gonna ask if you will start us off. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So my name is Allison Bartlett and I am the manager of disability programs with the Huntington's Disease Society of America. I am a licensed attorney and before joining HDSA, I practiced in the area of disability law and I specialize representing HD families that made up the bulk of my clients, which is why I'm here today. And so one of the most important things for you guys to know from a legal and disability perspective for living with HD is to plan ahead as best you can and be as prepared as possible. And so what this looks like is just kind of knowing what your options are. Um, unfortunately with HD, there are a lot of legal complexities that surround Huntington's disease and a lot of families fall into these gaps, which is why preparing and planning ahead can really help with that. And so thinking about things like if your employer offers short-term or long-term disability, making sure you get signed up for that if you know you're gonna have to stop working one day. And that's nice because it means when you're ready to apply for social security disability and you've stopped working, you have a nice stopgap measure and you're still getting income and you're not going without any sources of income. Because unfortunately, we all know it can take a long time to get disability. And it can also take a long time to get Medicaid benefits. There are a lot of strict rules and regulations and none of this is easy or complicated. The government did not make this easy for anybody, including us attorneys. And so it's good to ask questions. And so the farther ahead that you can plan and prepare, that gives you more time to ask the right people the right questions so you know how to protect yourself moving forward. Great, thank you, Allison. Uh, Dr. Bruce Compass, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Bruce Compass. I'm a professor of psychology at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I wanna sort of compliment what Allison said. If you ask from my perspective, um, an important thing about living well with HD, but generally living well, we can live in the future. And often we live in the future in ways that we worry about it. We can live in the past and often in ways that we regret. And the best advice I have is to spend some time, at least a little bit of time in the present. And the best way to live in the present is to focus on gratitude. Find something that you can feel that you can appreciate, something you can feel thankful for in spite of everything, everything that's going on with HD, everything that's going on with COVID-19. Be thankful, be grateful, be present. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
Dr. Mary Edmondson, would you like to introduce yourself? You are muted by the host. You are unmuted by the host. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my name is Mary Edmondson. I'm an internist and a psychiatrist by training. Um, I founded HD Reach uh, back 11 years ago um, for the purpose, uh, all the purposes that, that Debbie um, explained to you earlier and in incredibly um, grateful for all the people who have worked so hard to keep HD Reach um, going and um, all of the pe all the lives that they have helped, you know, people that they've helped. I think the last time I heard, we've interacted with about a thousand people, which is a thousand families, which is who knows how many beyond that. So um, I also took care of Huntington's patients in my private practice. Um, I took care of people um, in an interesting way through HD Reach in that I supported the social workers who were caring for um, patients. And then um, I worked with my um, good friend and colleague, Bert Scott at um, Duke University for several years, who has taught me everything I know about the motor aspects of Huntington's disease. Um, what would I like you to know today? Uh, so it's been 40, almost 50 years that I've been trying to figure out Huntington's disease. and. What I can tell you is that families that talk openly about Huntington's disease, not just with their kids, but with each other and openly with the person who has Huntington's disease, always seem to fare better. And I think that's because when you talk to somebody who has Huntington's disease, and most importantly, you listen, that's, that validates that person's existence as a human being. And I think it's, it's pretty hard to understand sometimes people with Huntington's as the disease advances, but there's still a person inside there and that person still listens to you and they still can make very good judgments about how well they're being treated and how much they're being ignored. So um, I, I think that if there was anything that I would want you to know is to stay a family, talk like a family and um, continue to involve your loved ones who have Huntington's. Thank you, Mary. Travis Scholar, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. <clears throat> My name is Travis Scholar. Uh, I'm a physical therapist in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I have been a physical therapist for over eight years. Uh, very early into my career, I started becoming specialized in uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, I'm a board certified clinical specialist in neurologic physical therapy. Uh, and I'm also the staff therapist at the um, Hunt Hunt Huntington's Disease Society of America Center of Excellence with Prisma Health USC Neurology. Um, I think, obviously I'm gonna be very biased with, with what I think is um, important for living with HD. And I think it's gonna be exercise and, and realizing that, that exercise truly is medicine. And just like you would take any medication any day, um, making sure that you, no matter the stage that you're in, making sure that you're, you're starting exercise in some way and keeping up with it. Uh, and then to just piggyback with some of these, what has already been said is kind of creating your team, creating it early. And that's, that's including your social team, your, your family, uh, your friends, also creating your, your medical team from neurology to psychiatry, to uh, social work, to nursing, to your rehab team, um, making sure you have those people in place. Cause that's going to be really important for your success. And, and then lastly, something I'm going to kind of piggyback from the Davis Finney foundation is, is, um, is celebrating, your everyday victories. You know, how, it doesn't matter really how small those victories are or how large those victory, victories are. Uh, living in the present, like Dr. Compass said, and, and celebrating those everyday victories. That's great. Thank you, Travis. Um, Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman and Dr. Tressman, would you like to go next and introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman. Um, I wear a couple of different hats in the HD community. One is that I'm the director of Carilion Clinic's Huntington's Disease Program here in Roanoke, Virginia. I'm also the special programs director at HD Reach, uh, and I'm also on the board of directors at the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. So I wear a couple of different hats in the HD community. I've been part of the HD community for about two decades. Uh, in terms of my perspective, I think knowing that there are resources out there 
that, that there, whether you are talking to kids, whether you want to um, find out about nutrition or physical therapy or movement, that there are resources out there. You just need to, to look and find them. And that really does piggyback off of what Travis was saying is to make sure that you are connected with a healthcare team. Um, if you go to a doctor who says, I don't think there's anything that can be done, or I think you should be tested or you shouldn't be tested, and they're not actually in the HD community and know, it's okay to look other places, to look for the resources, because they really are there in multiple languages and in multiple uh, disciplines. So know that, that if you need help, there's a lot of different resources that you can find. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Bob Trestman. I'm a psychiatric consultant to HD Reach. I'm a professor of psychiatry and chair of psychiatry at the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine and Carilion Clinic. And in terms of the kinds of specifics for thinking about Huntington's disease and our families, particularly now at the time of COVID-19, there's so much anxiety, there's so much fear, there's so much frustration that is a part of everyone's life. HD is one element of it that can really exacerbate, make it a lot more challenging. And so the only recommendation I would have, which weaves in to everything that's already been said, quite honestly, is don't feel alone. There are resources and it's so important to reach out. And now just like with this conference, electronically you can reach out to people who are expert in supporting you and your family worldwide. And my encouragement is to do that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Ann Lassiter, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ann Lassiter. Uh, I'm the former executive director of HD Reach. I was a member of the board and probably my um, biggest criteria is that I am a member of an HD family. I've been living with Huntington's in my family since I was 11. So um, I'm not 22, so well over my uh, half my life. Um, so as I've watched um, families live with this disease, and I've watched my own family live with this disease, my biggest piece of advice is to be open and honest with each other. Talk about Huntington's, which you all have heard about from um, the other panelists. But the other thing is, you know, as, as I've watched people over the years, each generation, it's different for each generation. But be aware that how you're managing with Huntington's, your openness, your willingness to talk about it, paves the way for the next generation to live well with Huntington's. And they can learn from what you're doing and all the good things you've been doing along the way. So be proud of how you're working with your families on Huntington's, your openness, and know that you're doing more just by living a good life and asking for help when you need it. That's great. Thank you, Anne. And Chandler Swope, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Chandler Swope, and I'm the Director of Youth Services for the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. Um, we're a global nonprofit that works with young people impacted by HD. Um, you know, a lot of what I think is, is important has been said. I think communication, open, honest communication is key in families, knowing that particularly with young people, they have a right to know about HD. They have a right to have a safe place to talk about HD. Um, but I also think that recognizing within families, everybody gets to live their journey with HD the way that is best for them. Um, and we, within families, within the community, we need to honor that and respect that because what works for one person doesn't work for another. And particularly in families, finding that common ground of how to communicate when not everyone communicates the same way, not everyone has the same thoughts and beliefs about how to live well with HD, and that happens. Um, but the more open and honest communication families can have and respectful communication can make that a lot easier. Wow, that's fantastic. Great. Thank you all so much for being here. And I'm going to jump right in with our first question um, that I want to address to Anne, Dr. Bonnie, Mary, and Travis. And that is what adjustments can be made during the prodromal or early stages of HT to maximize independence? Anne, would you like to start? 
Sure, sure. Um, so the prodromal stage is the stage before um, a lot of the movements start to take place and it's more cognitive and psychiatric things that start to happen. And probably the number one thing that you can do is get some help. Um, you know, I've heard Dr. Edmondson say before, if you have anxiety or depression, which are uh, common symptoms, get some help for that because there's a lot you can, you can do to help solve for that. You know, if you're starting to see some things, um, use, use the normal types of things that help people remember things, use lists, um, and, and talk about this. You know, spend time talking um, about what symptoms, if you have HD, what things are happening and how you can problem solve around it. Um, our, one of our greatest superpowers is actually um, problem solving. So the way you do that is you brainstorm and you talk to each other and you come up with some outside the box ways of living life on a daily basis, um, using some tricks and tips to, to get you around that. So to me, it's very practical things after you've gotten the, the medical help that you need, um, things that just are, are um, like lists and calendars and using your smartphone and reminders and, and all of those things that can help you. That's great. Dr. Bonnie, would you like to share your wisdom? Actually, Debbie, I think uh, Dr. Burton Scott's on the line. So if you wanted to go back just to have an introduction for him. I'm so sorry, Bert. Please uh, that's introduce fine. yourself. Uh, so yes, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Burton Scott. I'm a uh, movement disorders neurologist at Duke University. Um, been seeing uh, Huntington's folks for uh, a little over two decades. And uh, back when I started seeing uh, folks, uh, we were blessed to have Mary Edmondson come to our clinic and she may have learned some things from us, but we learned more from her, uh, from her, um, her insight from the psychiatric aspects of, of Huntington's disease. But so we have a, uh, a uh, uh, Huntington's Disease Society of America uh, Center of Excellence at, at Duke uh, and um, I'm also involved with the, uh, with the HD REACH um, board as well. Um, and uh, I, I guess as far as a, a tip, I would echo what others have said that it's, it's just very important to develop your, to develop your team, your team of support, uh, because Huntington's disease, as people that live with it and people that are in families with Huntington's know, uh, this is not a, this is a marathon kind of a race. It's not a sprint and people need help. We all need help, but people with Huntington's need help over time. And it's important, very important to develop a team that you can uh, work with as things evolve, uh, a team of support that includes, as others have said, your family, uh, your friends and, and medical expertise. So developing a team is, um, is, is what I would emphasize here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott, and welcome, and my apologies. No problem. <laughs> so for just to, it really actually does piggyback of, of what Dr. Scott was saying, I think in terms of adjustment, um, that even in early stages, when you do have a connection with a healthcare team, then you can monitor how things are going. And when you have communication with your family and have open communication to say, here's where I am now. I might not have um, symptoms or I might have early symptoms, but the more that we can communicate because I as a patient might not be able to see some of the progression, I think that that might really help. So it's very much what Anne was, was mentioning, but also just really working with a healthcare team and making sure that you do follow up, whether that's six months, whether that's every year, or whether it's much more frequent because you feel that you just wanna to touch base with somebody. Also, having that connection with a healthcare team allows you to be able to talk to them about clinical trials that might be available. So being a part of an observational trial, such as Enroll HD, will give you an opportunity to possibly get into other trials. And we are really looking for people in those very early stages. So that's really nice in terms of working with a healthcare team. Great, thank you. And Mary, would you like to answer the same question? Yeah, sure. Um... It's, you, you asked it so long ago that I've kind of forgot the context <laughs> of the question, but I think it's about um, what can you do early on to, to um, uh, set yourself up to succeed um, with a life with Huntington's disease. So 
The first thing that I would suggest is that you explore um, the correct healthcare team, like Bert was saying. But I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of practical advice about how to do that and the order in which you need to do that. So before you call a healthcare provider, it um, is a really smart idea to understand and explore your legal rights. Um, because before you um, have any medical records or any things on paper, you have to explore whether or not what, like what things you're capable of receiving before you are considered at risk and what you're able to receive afterwards. And so um, having disability insurance, life insurance, um, long-term long care insurance uh, is really important. I think understanding that you have a right to health care regardless um, of this particular disease and that you have a right to work. Um, so I think that's the first step is exploring your legal rights. Um, I think you should carefully choose your providers. This has the potential, a likely potential to be a lifelong relationship and you need to date your provider a little bit. I mean, you wouldn't just marry somebody off the street. Why do we choose doctors that way? So I think that you, you need to check them out. And most people like, like Bert and Bonnie and, um, you know, the other healthcare providers that are on this call, um, they, they do things like give these talks. They do go to support group meetings. They, they are invited to go to national meetings. And you can learn a lot about somebody by listening to them on this kind of a call and, or um, in person to decide if you feel like they're the right person for you. So choose carefully. Um, you need to consider your readiness to know the truth. Um, and readiness is very different from one person to another. Um, everybody constructs their own plan and like Chandler was just talking about because I had to write it down what she said is you have to a right to do it your way and until there's a definitive treatment you, you that what you the things that you can do are all related to what makes you function the best makes you happiest makes you the best person you, that you can be so um, consider readiness and what um, what you want this to look like when this process of becoming a patient, like you want to know what that looks like before you, you start tackling it. And then finally, um, I think uh, everybody needs to choose a really, really supportive and mature partner to go this path with them. So it's a very different relationship that, than you would have with a friend. It's a very different relationship than you would necessarily have with your minister because people that that decide they're going to love people who are at risk or love people with Huntington's they're going to walk down a, a tough path of their own and um, at the same time you have really strong people that come into your life for a short period of time and there's not the expectation that they're going to walk the long road with you so I think having a conversation about the role of that person in your life and what you expect and what they expect and being open with them is every bit as important as being open with your family. So I guess um, the most important thing I would say, and this is completely a personal opinion, I don't have any data to support this at all, but the people that I've seen who prepare early, they seek diagnosis early. Um, it, it's not the end of the world for them. And sometimes the diagnosis can actually be sort of a beautiful spiritual event. It's one of the most important things you'll ever do in your life. And um, so it, it's not, it doesn't have to be devastating. And, but you have to decide what you want it to look like. So um, I'd like to empower you to do that. Thank you very much, Larry. And Travis, can you answer? The question was about um, adjustments that can be made during the prodromal or early stages of AHD to maximize independence. Absolutely. I think um, all the, the recommendations for adjustments up to this point have been spot on, but I think the one area where I'm going to focus um, you know, my, my attention with, with these recommendations is what I know best, and that's me exercise. Uh, and I think um, specifically being proactive uh, in the earlier stages and prodromal stages and, and not being reactive and waiting until later on when, when now we're having more issues with movements and, and quality of life. But uh, I think 
you know, even in the prodromal stages and in the early stages, there's there's research showing that it's it's beneficial for cognition and and day to day activities and even a motor function. So um, doing it, starting exercising uh, when you're moving well, when you're thinking better, um, taking small steps now to start incorporating, and that might be just reading reading about it, you know, educating yourself of, of how exercise can benefit you. Um, but also then taking small steps. Maybe it's put, getting a network of people in place uh, to help encourage you on days that you don't feel like you want to exercise or maybe a workout buddy or an accountability partner. Uh, and I think by, um, by being proactive, by incorporating exercise slowly, um, I think in doing it while you are thinking better, moving better, you're going to start building your self-efficacy and confidence that you can do this, that you can exercise. So that when down the road, when things start to change a little bit, and maybe it gets harder, right? You have you have that you can fall back on knowing that you've done this in the past, um, and you can continue to do this uh, now and in the future, uh, just with some small adjustments. That's great. Thank you. Um, this next question, I'm going to ask to Bert, Allison, uh, Bob, Chandler, and Bruce. The question is, what recommendations can you give to caregivers that you have seen work well for others? And Bert, would you like to get us started? Yeah, so um, I would start uh, by saying I think it's um, important and people benefit from uh, developing some sort of a healthy uh, routine, um, uh, which incorporates um, uh, enough sleep, uh, you know, regular nutritious meals and uh, recreation. Um, and uh, in the recreation part of that, one might, um, you know, find some sort of a project that, um, that you can see results from, that you can um, complete in, in uh, steps and you can see results along the way and results um, uh, at the end. Um, but patients, do seem to do best when they have when they have a routine. Now, uh, the routine's going to change over time, and there will be perturbations to the routine. But um, if you have a, a a base where expectations are being met, because at a you know generally at a certain time one kind of activity is going to happen, and then at another time another sort of activity is going to happen. Um, patients seem to do better with that for a longer period of time, and then one can introduce um, other activities as, as time goes on. But having a routine, uh, getting you know, sufficient sleep uh, with regu regular meals, and then uh, putting in some time for, for recreation uh, is all, all very important. Great, thank you. And Allison, we'll turn to you. So one thing that I definitely recommend is when it comes time to submit a disability application, the caregiver or friend or family should be completing at least 50% of the application with the HD individual because by the time you're completing a disability application, it means you already have symptoms and a lot of times those are cognitive symptoms and the disability application process is difficult enough as it is and that burden cannot fall on the HD impacted individual to complete that by themselves and complete it successfully. And I would even recommend that the caregiver should be the main contact person. Like so you in the disability application and ask for the person's primary residence, but you can put in a different address if you want mail sent somewhere else. You can put in a different phone number if you don't trust that the HD individual will answer social security's phone calls. And these are really important things to consider. I, I, it took me a while, but I came up with an analogy last night. It's like if you're a pitcher in baseball and you break your arm, well, then you can't pitch, but it also wouldn't make sense to move you to third base because your arm is still broken and you still can't throw the ball. That's kind of how it is if you expect someone with HD who has cognitive difficulties to be able to complete the disability application on their own. Yeah, you took them off the pitchers now, they're not working anymore, but you're just moving them to another position on the field that they're still gonna struggle with. And so it really helps to really be involved in that process and also to echo what a lot of other people have said. I think everyone else has said this, um, having that support system. And also with you're the individual with HD, you don't always recognize your symptoms. And so having someone else help you through that process means you can complete and submit a more detailed and accurate application. 
because when you have HD and because we know that these symptoms can progress slowly over time, you may not be aware of these things every day. You live with it. It is your new normal. And what your normal is, is very different than like the average working American. And that's what social security wants to see. So the more help you have getting that, the better. And if you've done a really good job of getting your care team, like with all of these awesome people on the call, you may never actually need my help because if you've done everything to do everything and get everything in place in the first place, you have a great medical care team, you have all the other things in place, those things may speak for themselves. Like if your doctor has great medical record notes and social security can see that, then you may not ever need an attorney because your case speaks for itself. Great, thank you. And Bob. Can you answer this question? Of course. Caregiving is an enormously enriching experience for most people. Part of who we are as people is that we love being in relationships and we take great emotional satisfaction in those relationships. Sometimes they can be very easy. Sometimes they can, uh, we take more than we give. And in a relationship, when you're caring for someone with Huntington's disease, over time, you may end up shifting that balance from taking more to giving more. It is, as was mentioned already, a marathon. It spans months and years, and the demands keep changing. And so it's really important to recognize a few things. As people, we have our limits. As people, we need other people. And so it's really crucial that if you are going to be successful in not only in the role of being a caregiver, but of being an individual as well, that you seek support, that you care for yourself, that you make sure that all the appropriate recommendations that we have for people with HD, you follow as well that you make sure you get enough sleep, that you eat well, that you exercise, that you take care of your own health, that you find and make use of support groups. What we find is that so many people feel that they are going down this road in an isolated way. But that if they find that there's so many other people walking similar paths, they can share the emotional support from one caregiver to another usually facilitated by a professional, they can take great emotional strength and creativity in the love and the care that they can provide. Thank you. Thank you. And Chandler, what are your thoughts? Um, a lot of mine are very similar to Bob's, which I think means we spend too much time together. <laughs> but um, I think it is, you know, caregiving, I think, you know, is, is the hardest job somebody has to do, whether it's being a parent or caregiving for a loved one with a disability or an illness, um, but it can give so much back. I think the biggest thing is remembering you don't have to do it all on your own. Um, it can be very easy to fall into the pattern of, I'll just do it myself. Um, I'm the only one that can do this. I know what's best. And generally you probably do. Um, but reminding yourself to give breaks for yourself, to find ways if there's often feelings of guilt along with caregiving, you're not doing enough, you should be doing more. If something happens that it's, it's your fault, if there was a fall or something happens. And so if you're having those feelings, finding ways to let go of the guilt, to tell yourself that you are doing the best job that you can do. HD is incredibly difficult. You know, day to day, it looks differently. Um, day to day, things change. Um, and so giving yourself the time and the space to let go of guilt, take care of yourself, take breaks. And remember that asking for help is, you know, the sometimes the hardest thing to do, but the thing that will, you know, bring more into your life, asking for help from other caregivers, whether it's tips, recommendations, asking professionals, um, you know, there's no magic answer to any of this. Um, but the more you talk to others, the more you try different things. And the more, you know, you give yourself a break that nobody's perfect at this, the easier some of those things can be. Thank you. And lastly, Bruce, will you answer this question? Sure. About recommendations Best, to caregivers. Sure. Best thing about going last is I can say ditto. Uh, <laughs> everybody just had such great points. But um, based on 
my initial work now in Huntington's, but also 30 years of working with families faced with cancer, depression, heart disease, et cetera. I'd highlight three things. Uh, first is remember, uh, back in the day, we used to fly on airplanes and we used to fly on airplanes. Flight attendants would say, put your oxygen mask on first and then help those around you. So that's the first thing is we've heard lots of tips on how to help yourself and you really have to take care of yourself first, manage your own emotions, take care of your health, exercise, time for yourself, support groups, um, mindfulness, all of those things are gonna help you be a better resource to people in your family. Second is when people in our lives do things that upset us and frustrate us, we often ask ourselves, why did they do that? And often we come to a conclusion that they did it on purpose. And in this case, they didn't. Um, there's a difference between what Huntington's causes people to do and what those people are. So remind yourself, it wasn't on purpose. Those difficulties are things that they can't control and that gets harder and harder as the disease moves on. So be careful of that question, watch that question. And then the third is lean in and listen. And we've heard that. Um, and good listeners not only listen, but the first thing they say after they've listened is they sort of repeat back what they heard. So listen and validate. Tell folks you know what they said, you think you understand what they feel. Try that first, lean in, listen. So put your oxygen mask on and lean in and listen. Thanks. That's great. Um, everybody has given so many wonderful things already, um, but I would like to ask this next question on, we are living through a pandemic right now. Um, so I would like to ask if everybody could give us their one piece of best advice about living well with HD during these interesting times that we're in right now. And I'm gonna do this again alphabetically, but I'll reverse it. So Chandler, would you go first this time? Yeah, I think, the biggest piece is just go easy on yourself right now. I don't think anybody's okay right now, even in the best of circumstance. So just give yourself a break, you know, do what you can each day. And the days that are hard to motivate, the days that the entire family is, is you know, feeling unmotivated, be okay with that and just take care of each other, you know, reach out to the loved ones far away. Um, but just remember that, you know, it's okay not to be okay right now. And you don't have to, you know, do a million things to get every day to, to feel successful. You know, find one thing that you can feel successful and grateful about um, each day. And that's, that's enough right now. Thank you, Dr. Scott. So I would say that at this time when we're, um, some of us are self quarantined and we're, we're maintaining social distance, uh, wearing masks, when uh, uh, we're trying to taper off the effects of the virus. Um, I would encourage people to try to stay connected nevertheless. And that connection can come by using the telephone or if you're uh, tech savvy, like the folks that organize this meeting are, uh, you can do video chats with people or Skyping or that sort of thing, but try to stay connected with each other electronically if you can, um, even though you may not be able to uh, maintain the physical connections that we'd like to maintain, but those will come back once the, once the pandemic is over. Try to maintain um, electronic connections with each other. Thank you, and Anne? Yeah, so it's an interesting time. We are all together a lot, and there's a lot to be um, thankful for, for for that. A slower pace, time together with family, the the um, the return of the family meal. We're all cooking a lot. I've heard of the quarantine 15. You know, all of those kinds of things that are happening. Um, so it's good to be together, but don't forget to find some your you time right some time on your own doing some of your own things um, you don't have to be in the same room all the time together you can take a little walk by yourself or you can um, read by yourself you, it, all this togetherness is good but make sure you take some time to be um, a lot some alone time because um, it's good to have that as much as you you like being around your family it's okay to spend some time and not do every single thing together. Right, and speaking of together, Dr. Vani's and Dr. Bob, <laughs> would you like to, to go next? Sure, 
So I have two thoughts. The first is breathe. It is so important both to be in the moment as well as to control your anxiety by breathing and breathing slowly, not to survive, but to thrive. And there are so many different videos and, and guidances about how to effectively breathe. So please consider practicing breathing. The other is structure. In general, when we're self-isolating, particularly in a family, make sure you try to structure the day so that there are different times when you're doing different things. So if you have that structure, you can rely on it. You'll feel stable. You'll feel things are more predictable. And certainly in a family with someone affected directly by HD as a patient, providing predictable structure will make it far more comfortable for everyone in the environment to feel both safe and that life is going on and it's going to reduce a lot of the frustration. Just to add to that, I think that it's really helpful for people to know that when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling depressed, that that's the normal right now. So knowing that people are feeling that way um, is, can be really helpful because it normalizes. And I think if you can visualize, sometimes when people feel you know, that they're not sure where to get groceries or how to pay bills or everything is piling up, it almost looks like, as I explained to some patients, a huge pile of spaghetti. And you just, you can't attack it because it's just, it's too big. But if you could take one strand out and say, what is it I can do today? What is it that I can focus on that I can accomplish today? Then that can be really helpful. But know that what you're feeling right now is normal and I, I think it will get better. So we have to just make sure we get through that, that one day uh, to bring us to the next day. Great, and Travis, you're up. Sure, I feel like uh, Dr. Compass right now, I just wanna say ditto to everybody. <laughs> but uh, to, to kind of piggyback off what Dr. Bob said, um, the idea of, of providing structure in your day and scheduling it and, and specifically um, the area that I'm passionate about being exercise uh, making sure that you schedule exercise into your day and just and, and, you know, maybe it's not per se exercise but being physically active not being a couch potato all day but being physically active if you're if it's safe for you to exercise exercise um, and if you can try to be specific about the timing of your exercise say it you know maybe I'm going to exercise at two o'clock on Tuesday. The, you know, if you are more specific with the timing of that scheduling and incorporating the exercise, it's more likely to happen because uh, I think everyone knows that our days get busy. Uh, even if we are at home, the days get away from us. And the next thing you know, it's eight or nine o'clock at night and you thought, oh man, I didn't exercise. So um, exercise um, because of not only the neuroprotective effects, but um, like, like what's already been said, there's, you know, stress and anxiety levels are higher now and, and exercise and physical activity is a great outlet to, uh, to address a lot of that. Very true. And Mary, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'm going to be really practical about a couple of problems um, that I think are going to be specific to people with HD in the middle of this pandemic. So the first thing is that people with Huntington's disease, if you say, we're gonna go do this now, and it, it, alter, it alters their daily routine, the first thing they're gonna say is no. Okay, just that's the first thing they're going to say. And so if you are a caregiver and you notice that the person that, sh that with HD around you has got a fever and they appear a little short of breath, um, and you're worried that they're sick, um, the first thing to do is to call your doctor. But if you have to get somebody to the hospital who has Huntington's, don't ask their permission. Call 911. Call somebody that'll be there, a secondary person who will help pack that person up and take them to the emergency room because that could be life-saving for this. And it's not on you as a caregiver to make a determination as to how seriously ill somebody is. You, you need other people to help you with that. So the first reaction is gonna be no, and your reaction is gonna be to call the, the primary care doctor who's working with you first. Maybe they would wanna talk to you online. Maybe they'll say, no, we're just gonna have to directly take him or her directly to the hospital or whatever. But my, I guess my point is that 
you know, there are people that are experts in this disease and at, it's a time when you need their help. Don't try and figure it all out yourself if you become concerned from somebody. And, and I don't think that it's sort of like asking somebody who has Huntington's to do their part, you know, to do 100% of a disability application. You can't expect somebody who has Huntington's, that is that they're cognitively impaired and they're physically ill to be able to act in their own best interest. I just, I just think you, and likewise as a caregiver, you shouldn't, you shouldn't carry the burden of making that decision yourself either. So if you're worried, take steps, don't ask permission. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is that the most important thing that we can do to protect ourselves from COVID is to wash our hands frequently and not touch our face. So how easy is that going to be with the Huntington's patient, you know, who's, you know, kind of a mess like all the time. So um, I think that if you've never tried this before, you will see it pays dividends. If you can find a favorite song or you can find a favorite little ditty or a little poem or a little saying or a fond memory or something like that, and you distract the person with Huntington's by singing to them something that is that they'll be happy with, you can take advantage of the fact they don't multitask. You're cleaning their hands while you're singing them a song. So um, it's a perfect time to like add in to an unpleasant task for the person with Huntington's, something that's more pleasant than the hand washing is unpleasant, if that makes sense. So I, I think that um, being prepared, having like a family safety plan, like, so my husband and I are both physicians and we both sat down and we said, okay, what are we gonna do if one of us gets sick? You know, who's, who's, gonna, who's gonna support the person taking care of me? What room are you gonna sleep in? All of that kind of stuff. And so I think it's, um, it's sort of considering the worst case scenario and making plans for it ahead. And, and I would suggest that everybody do that. All of us on this call, all of us that are listeners, everybody come up with a strategy for what you're gonna do if, if uh, you know, the unfortunate happens. Thank you. And uh, Bruce, you're not last, but almost. <laughs> do you wanna go next? Uh, double ditto again. Um, <laughs> So about 20 or 30 years of research on how people cope with stress that's relevant for COVID uh, has validated the serenity prayer. So what we need to do is control and change the things we can, accept the things that we can't change and that we can't control and have the wisdom to know the difference. So that works and that works in general and it works here. So we've heard great tips for what you can control. Uh, you can control your risk through social distancing you can control your risk through hygiene. You can structure your day. You can build an exercise. All of those are things you can do to get on top of this and feel like it's not all getting away from me. On the other hand, what we can't control is how long it's gonna last, what the course of it's gonna look like, is it gonna come back in the fall, et cetera. So we really have to practice things like acceptance, staying in the moment, and reappraisal. Um, for some folks, being together 24 hours a day um, can be a challenge, but we can reframe it and say this is a, we're gonna look back on this as a remarkable time in our lives that brought us closer together. And as challenging as these times are, find those things you can accept and reappraise and think about it different, in different ways, and then go after the things that you can control. And one other thing we can control, I strongly recommend this, I had to get after myself about this early on, is turn off the news. So if CNN is running an, in a script in the background for you all the time, you're gonna get more anxious, you're gonna get more worried. So dose yourself on the news and dose yourself on your worries. Great. Allison, can you answer this question as the last one? Yes, actually, and I have something that other people haven't brought up. You can still ask for help. Organizations are still providing assistance. Your doctors are providing telehealth care. Social Security is still operating. Attorneys are changing the way that they operate, and they're taking a lot more phone calls and video things over the phone. So a lot of organizations that help people and provide the assistance to HD families are still in operation and are still answering questions and are still here to help you. And so the days that you do get overwhelmed, you do have people to turn to, so don't forget that. 
Okay, it's my turn to say ditto that HD Reach is one of those organizations and we're always here to help you. That's what we're, we're up and open and, and welcome anybody's calls at any time. Um, but right now we're up and open and welcoming your questions and Heather Burns already has a stack of them. So she's gonna read them out and we'll let our speakers answer the questions that you have on your mind. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Yes, I have stack. So uh, let's try to keep it as brief as possible. So maybe one or two people answer. Because um, we have about eh, a little over 30 minutes to go. Okay. First question. Can you please describe the general stages of HD to help us anticipate and prepare? This is covered in a session today. Please share main points and resource for further information in the Q&A. Thank you. Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> it's a pretty long answer. I admit, Heather, I was actually focusing on finding my uh, participant screen, so I didn't hear the question. It might be something I could answer. Can you read it again? <laughs> uh, sure. Can you please describe the general stages of HD to help us anticipate and prepare? That's okay. the short question. Uh, so I can start on that. This is Bert. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, um, research-wise, uh, Huntington's is divided into five stages, but in general, we've got um, uh, early, uh, sort of middle, and late stages. And early stages are where folks are having um, uh, a little bit of trouble, um, they, they may have a little bit of trouble with, uh, with movement, but they're also having a little bit of trouble with their memory, maybe some difficulty uh, performing, their, performing their work, performing their job. Um, uh, you can sort of back up and say that Huntington's involves motor problems, in other words, movement problems, thinking problems, and behavior kinds of problems. And in general, the, the early stages uh, can involve uh, modest deficits of each of those areas. And then middle stages, folks are getting to the point where they're no longer to able to work. Uh, they may be having more movements that are difficult to control, more problem behaviors. Um, and certainly then late stages would be where uh, uh, folks uh, need constant supervision. Uh, <clears throat> they're unable to perform uh, their activities of daily living, uh, they, need, they need help with every aspect of their, of their care, and they're more of a setup for infections and, um, and, and falls and, um, um, and loss of life because of those things. So you can kind of divide things into an early stage, a middle stage, and a late stage, although it's, it's divided in more detailed levels for, for research. Great. All right. Mary, did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to sort of take a 20,000 foot look and look across somebody's entire lifespan who's a gene carrier. Um, so the period of time from birth until somebody begins to develop even the most subtle signs is called the non manifest stage of Huntington's disease. That is, that you're a gene carrier but you don't have any functionally significant um, signs of Huntington's disease, even though there may be some um, actions of the abnormal gene and protein that are going on, there's enough compensatory mechanisms that the person who's the gene expansion carrier is not experiencing any functional decline. The second major period of time is called the prodromal period. And that begins when people begin to notice some subtle um, cognitive and or behavioral problems and that have functional significance. So it may be that if you looked at two different people, one of them had lots of cognitive support, like they have a spouse who takes over things that they would, um, you know, slips in a little bit of extra, extra support so the person with Huntington's can continue to do a task whereas another person would have nobody around to help them do that. And so it would be obviously more functionally significant in that individual. So it's, a, it's this balance between how good are, you know, how much damage has been done and 
um, by the gene and the protein and how much compensatory mechanisms there are. But in general, disease begins when somebody's got problems. And so that's really the onset of Huntington's disease, whether it's shortly before motor onset or years before motor onset. So that's what defines prodromal Huntington's. From um, a research point of view, those stages are divided into three different groups, stage A, B, and C, based on sort of a predicted time to motor onset. Um, during, the per during the prodromal period, people have can lose jobs based on their symptoms. They can have marital problems based on their symptoms. Um, and I think one of the things that I find most troubling is that around the time that people go from stage C prodromal Huntington's to early motor Huntington's disease um, is the one of the two times that are most likely for people to attempt suicide. So being a psychiatrist, I worry about such things. Um, but at the same time, it is also the high, that, that appears to be the time that people begin to develop anagnosia. So it, from a 20,000 foot look over somebody's entire life, um, there's a a non-manifest stage, a prodromal stage, and then there's the stages that Burke just described, which are the stages of motor manifest Huntington's. Great. Okay. Uh, we have a question from David Logston. Question, WRT HD1 <clears throat> clinical trial happening currently in Phoenix and nationwide. What kind of timeline do we expect to see this treatment come into production once the trial finalizes in a few years? Anybody? Uh, I can't say I have any good information on that. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't have anything to contribute for that one. I don't know if we have the answer at this moment, and if somebody does, um, speak up. But if not, then I'm happy to do some research and talk to people in the, in the medical community and see if I can get an answer and respond and post that on the website. Great. Okay, do you see me? Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I mean, the study's ongoing. They're uh, gathering information, um, uh, but um, how it's proceeding, uh, you know, so far, uh, indications that um, I hear are that the, the, the safety is, is good, but, um, um, but as far as results in patients, the most important part, um, that hasn't been uh, publicized yet. Okay. And, and I'll also just add that uh, Dr. Victor Sung has done a presentation on the future of treatments and the upcoming clinical trials that's available on this website. He's done a whole seminar on this. So I invite everyone to check that out and to see um, the information that he covers because some of that's covered in there. Great. Okay, another question. Do CBDs help? You just say. Okay, uh, this is Dr. Bob. Um, we don't know is the short answer. Uh, there are many people who are experimenting with different forms of these cannabinoids or CBD. Um, the theory is that if you separate out the uh, THC, that is the part of marijuana that makes you high and just focus on the cannabinoids, the CBD part, that can, in theory, help with a range of problems from uh, pediatric seizures to uh, anxiety and uh, people are listing 50 different benefits. Um, almost none of them have support at this point. Uh, and so we do know, however, that there can be significant problems with motivation, uh, cognitive impairment. So uh, I'm very uh, uncomfortable about their use, unless it's under medical supervision. And we need clinical trials, you know, and, and I think that that's something that I think the HD community needs to hear from medical professionals that we will support uh, true clinical trials that are, are done uh, with sites who have regulations. 
So I think that when patients come to us and say, well, it makes me feel better, or I saw this on YouTube, um, that's not evidence-based. Um, and because you feel better doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for your brain. But as I say to my patients, I'm open that if there is a clinical trial, I will take a look at that. And I think that that's a great idea, but we're just not there yet. So something has to be very specific to Huntington's disease, at least my feeling, uh, is that something needs to be very specific in terms of Huntington's disease and a true clinical trial. And Mary, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, so like Bob said, there's no data about this um, in Huntington's, although there's a lot of active research in the general population. The one thing I, I think is that people should not smoke pot and they should not vape. And there's a couple reasons for that. We've got a respiratory pandemic going on. It's the worst thing that you can do right now is to smoke cigarettes or to, to smoke marijuana, even though um, they may, th may be things that make you feel better. They're also the risk, the, uh, the, hard, the largest risk for a complicated course with COVID. The second is that we don't know what we, w there are people that have had very adverse reactions to vaping. So I think that if you're going to decide to use um, a marijuana based or a CBD based product, I wouldn't buy it off the street. Um, and I, I specifically would not use products that have much in the way of, of THC. I, I would, I think it'd be a little safer to go on the, on the CBD spectrum. And the reason that I say this is that only, not only, but 10% of people with Huntington's develop psychosis across their life cycle. I mean, we don't know exactly why that's true, and it certainly is one of the more rare psychiatric syndromes associated with Huntington's, but it does happen. And I would not change my risk to become psychotic. Um, if I know that I have a 10% risk of, uh, higher than the general population, I would definitely stay away from THC and most specifically synthetic THCs. All right. Here's, here's one. Is there a cure for HD? Is there a way to slow it down? Uh, so there's no cure for Huntington's disease at this time. However, uh, what is exciting about this day is um, this era is that there are tests that are being done uh, looking at innovative treatments that may very well have an impact on disease course. They may help the disease course. Uh, but as, of, as it stands now, there are no, uh, there's no cure. Uh, a number of different drugs have, and interventions have been tried in the past looking to see if they modify um, uh, modify the, the, the disease course, but none of these have proven to be effective yet. However, uh, like I said, there are a number of, of clinical trials going on now testing new innovative treatments that we are hopeful will yield some, uh, uh, some good results, but no cure yet. To piggyback off of that, just remember though that we can treat symptoms. So if people are having some of these symptoms that all of us have talked about, it's really important to connect with the healthcare team. Right now, more than ever, we are so hopeful that there will be something to slow down, stop, and maybe even reverse the symptoms of Huntington's disease. We just don't know yet. The more people that are in these clinical trials, the better off it's going to be. That doesn't mean you have to force yourself, but this is something to talk to your healthcare team about, of what clinical trials am I eligible for? The more people we have in clinical trials, the faster we're going to find one of these. But please know that, that we can treat symptoms, so that's really important to talk to your healthcare team about. Great. So, um... Travis, I was going to ask you a question um, because I had other people mention to me that um, there were trials that looked at exercise and that at least in a phase two trial, um, there was evidence of slowing of progression with exercise and physical therapy. Is that, is that your recollection of that data? And has it, been, has it evolved any further?
Have we lost him? See his name up here. There we go. I was sorry about that. I was I was muted for a second. Um, I don't know of specific trials off the top of my head. Um, most of the the research and the trials that I've read have been more so um, not looking at changing the disease itself, uh, but more so having a greater impact on um, some of the, especially some of the motor manifestations that you uh, would see as the disease progresses. Uh, we know that there are neuroprotective effects of exercise, especially aerobic exercise. Um, and so can't, uh, you know, you would, you would sometimes you'll hear or read that it slows uh, the decline associated with the disease. Uh, what I would say is it, it has a strong impact in slowing the motor and physical decline associated with it. Thank you. Anne, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. Um, having lived with this disease in my family for a really long time, I've watched the progression from no hope, no cure, no treatment, no test, no anything. Um, and, and I have to say that even though right now there's not a cure, there's way more treatments, like Bonnie said, um, in terms of helping to, to manage the symptoms so that you can live a better life. I loved what, what Travis was saying about exercise. It's a huge benefit and it can really help, um, help with the symptoms over, over time. It helps everybody. So it's not just people with HD, it helps everybody. Um, but, but I think now is, is I'm, I'm so hopeful and what I see in these um, clinical trials and the people that are working in these clinical, clinical trials, they are, they are so dedicated to trying to find an answer for those of us that live with Huntington's, whether we're caregivers or loved ones or at risk or those of us that have HD. I've, I've not seen this kind of momentum um, for a really long time, actually ever. And so I, I'm so excited about it. The future, the future looks bright. I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I don't know what it's going to entail, but um, there's a real hope for, for the next generation and the generation after that, that there will be something to help us. It's just an exciting clinical trial time. I'm just so excited about it. Great. All right. Um, okay, we got another one. How do I talk with my young adult children about HD being in the family and about testing options available for them? And um, I have another similar questions about talking to your kids and grandkids about family and HD. Bonnie, you wanna rock, paper, scissors here? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, you could start. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is talking to kids is important and, and it's good to do, you know, there's a million different versions to how this goes. And, and the reality is, you know, the, what we do know is it's important to talk to kids, kids who know about HD uh, don't do worse. It, as scary and as overwhelming as HD is, being able to understand what's happening, being part of that conversation and having information is empowering. Um, it helps incorporate HD, so it's not sort of the, the elephant in the room or this giant bomb dropped on them, but it's something that is part of their normal, right? All our normals look different. Um, and so it doesn't have to be the only thing that defines them, it becomes a part of their story. Um, but we also know, I think, you know, from working in this field for a long time, that the way that happens looks different for every family. I have been working in the field not nearly as long as some people on this call. Um, and I can understand why there are reasons that families have waited, right? I've spoken with families where there's other terminal and critical illnesses going on in the family. There are other major life events happening. And so, you know, how much can, can people really take on at one time? You know, there's no great time to share this information as it comes out, but it's, you know, you guys are the experts on your children. We can give you tips and we know where the resources are to support not just you as a parent, but also young people. That has changed drastically over time. Um, when I joined the HD community uh, about six years ago, there was sort of one youth focused event in the country and now there's about six a year. In just six years, that's that's the difference we're seeing. There are, 
you know, young people are the largest and most vocal co cohort of the HD community. There are multiple ways to get involved. There are lots, lots of things. So it's really easy to, for many parents to think back to their own experience and say, well, what's the point? There's, there's nothing we can do, right? It's why even engaging in care for a long time was people didn't always do it because there's no way to treat it. There's no, you know, there wasn't the right information, but that has changed. Um, and so, you know, it's thinking about under knowing what your kids can handle, knowing the best time and way to approach your children, um, and knowing that, again, there's not one exact right way, but there are resources. I'll let Bonnie talk about her book. I, my talk that will be up on the site is about talking to kids. Um, and, I, you know, HDO is here to help you. We have groups for young people. We have um, resources for parents. We have ways to connect. We run camps around the world. So there's lots of things to make sure that young people get support, safe space, and most importantly, meet peers who are in similar situations. So it helps normalize that experience because HD can be really isolating and it doesn't have to be anymore. Again, even though we're socially, we're socially distancing ourselves, we may be in quarantine, you know, there are still lots of ways to connect. Um, and so even if there's nobody in your immediate community with HD, there are lots of ways virtually to connect. And, you know, young people have lived in a digital world their entire life. So whereas we may fumble with Zoom and Skype and whatever other formats we're using, these kids, that's, that's their every day. They've always had a cell phone in their hands. Um, and so we can, we can help facilitate that. And I think exactly to piggyback on, on what Chandler's saying is sometimes that parents feel, okay, I, I did the wrong thing or I didn't do this right. And there, there is no wrong or right time. Certainly by being part of this conference as well, you can say, now I've learned something. So you did the best job you could with the information that you had by using this as, as kind of this touchstone to say, I've got information that now I need to do this perhaps a different way. It's the answer is too long to, you know, to do two minutes for Chandler and myself. So know that there are resources. Even the second part of the question about testing, going on to hdyo.org HDYO and, and finding out about genetic testing, the questions to ask yourselves, making sure that your benefits are in place, all the things that we've talked about, it's all there. And know that you don't have to do it alone. You can reach out to Chandler. You can reach out to, to HDO, uh, HD Reach, and being able to, to talk this through with somebody, that's a really good first place to start because you will have feelings in terms of, as Chandler said, your history and your experience. And maybe it wasn't great. Maybe people didn't talk to you, but that that's what you learned and that's what you know. So I think being able to reach out to people to say, let me process some of my own stuff. Let me figure out how to go forward and let me get all of my ducks in a row. There are publications through HDSA, through um, the Canadian uh, organizations, through um, you know all different types of HD advocacies. Uh, you know my book on, on Amazon Kindle, talking to kids about HD, is available, and all the proceeds go back into uh, organizations like this. So, but I want to let you know the bottom line is that there are resources to do this. It's not just going to be a two-minute clip. You know, look at, at Chandler's presentation uh, that she did for, for HD Reach. I think that that's going to give a lot of the answers that people need in terms of asking that question as well. Great. Dr. Compass, would you like to add something? Sure. Um, so I want to echo what everybody has said, which is it's tough to keep a secret. And so talking openly and honestly, you have to figure out the time with your kids, adolescents, young adults. When you have the conversation, we've spent 20 years studying how families talk about illness and most of our information has come so far from how families talk about cancer but we're now in the midst of a study we video record parents and kids talking about disease and one of the things we've learned is when you start that conversation the impulse is going to be to give advice and give guidance and hold yourself hold back listen and validate first so listen to what they say tell them you heard what they said then give them some ideas. Uh, and a simple example was uh, from one of the first videos we had of, of families talking with a child who had cancer. The child says, boy, I just hate it when I have to go in for chemotherapy. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And one mom said, yeah, but don't, don't forget, when you go for chemotherapy, that's how we're gonna beat your disease. And the second mom says, yeah, I remember. I remember you cry and it makes you upset and it makes you sick and you just hate it. Turns out that second mom who validated first, listened first, got a better response from her kiddo than the one who wanted to jump in and give guidance. So 
talk about it, talk about it honestly. And first thing is listen, validate, tell them what you heard. Thank you. And Chandler, did you want to add more? Just real quick, sort of piggybacking off that. Um, I think most people on this call in terms of uh, the, the panelist, I think we're gonna start to see an uptick in younger people going, um, engaging in the testing process um, because of the, the amount of clinical trials that are, are coming um, on the scene. And I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit I'm not a parent, but I think a lot of parents sort of have a knee jerk reaction of you're too young to do this, particularly, you know, if, if somebody's 18 and as soon as they're allowed to test, they want to engage in that process. But again, it's about validating their experience. There are lots of resources and it's about re remembering that, you know, young people who have lived with HD their entire lives, you know, have a lot of information. They have a lot of experience to draw from. So it's about empowering and supporting young people in the testing process, making sure that they feel like they have control over the process um, and sort of being supportive in that. Even if, even if you disagree that that's the right time for them, um, you know, so I think there's lots of resources, but I, I speak with parents who are like, they're just too young, but remembering, I think, as Dr. Compass said, it's about validating and supporting first versus imparting your opinions and wisdom sometimes as, as the adults in their world. Thank you. I just want to give a really sh uh, short commercial for Dr. Bonnie, who did an excellent presentation on the whole process of genetic testing, and that's available on our website as part of this conference. So, I, you know, I recommend that anybody who is curious about what the process looks like, what's involved, what questions uh, are often asked, she's answered a lot of them in her, her video presentation. Okay, great. Um, okay. Can you please explain in how in vitro works for someone who is at risk of HD and does not want to pass it on to his or her children? Um, well, uh, I would say that um, I'm not an in vitro expert. However, um, I, I'll kick this off, I guess, by saying that uh, the in vitro is certainly a, a mechanism where um, the, the, uh, the OBGYN folks can um, select embryos that don't carry the Huntington's gene um, and implant them into, <clears throat> into the, the, the woman for pregnancy. And so it's, it's a situation where um, uh, egg is, uh, eggs are collected from the female and sperm is collected from the male and they're mixed together and embryos are developed, um, but selected for, um, tested for, um, to make sure that there's absence of the Huntington's gene such that um, embryos that are implanted into the female are, um, are without not carrying the disease. It's a very expensive process, um, but it is a way to um, to assure um, you know lack of transmission of the of the gene. Thank you. And Chandler, did you have something to add? I was going to say I think genetic counseling is a key component here. They'll have a lot of information. Um, HDO. We did a webinar with a genetic counselor from Vanderbilt recently, so that's up and available on YouTube. Um, but I think working with your HD center with the genetic counselor there and then whoever your OBGYN is. Um, and there, there are also some charities now to support the cost of that because it is, is, it is an option that is available. Um, but I also think when it comes to having kids, that's also a very uh, personal subject for people in the community. So remembering that no matter what your decision is around having children, um, only you and your partner need to feel comfortable with the decisions you're making um, because again there's lots of ethics and uh, religious and lots of reasons people make the decisions that they make but there are lots of amazing resources out there for families so they have the most up-to-date information on what science is doing. Great and Dr. Edmondson would you like to add? Yeah I just want to add one thing quickly. Um, so Martha Nance, who is a neurogeneticist and has created most of the HDSA protocols and 
has worked with, you know, three or four generations of Huntington's families. So she has a lot of experience with um, uh, several generations um, and, and generations of people who've asked this question, you know, how can I make sure that my child doesn't have Huntington's disease? And um, the first thing that she says that I think makes a ton of sense is that every reprodu reproductive choice is, a cho is completely independent of the others. So you may have one child that you simply had the old fashioned way without genetics, without genetic testing, without knowing your own genetic status. And then at another time in your life, you might choose to have a second child, but a child that is conceived through pre-genetic diagnosis, which is what the process that Bert just described. So I think it's important to understand that, that every choice is its own choice, its own independent choice. Um, the second thing that we haven't talked about is prenatal diagnosis, um, which is a very sticky problem. Um, if a woman gets accidentally pregnant or um, which uh, is probably the circumstance under which this would happen. So they're eight weeks pregnant and they, they come to a genetic counselor and, and ask for prenatal testing, which means that they take a sample of um, uh, part of the covering of the, the baby that has the baby's genetics in it. And they test that, that to see if the child is positive or negative with the intention that that, per, that pregnancy be terminated if it's positive. But here's the problem with that. One, it's really logistically difficult to organize if somebody shows up at six weeks because it takes several weeks for that to happen. And you might be beyond the first trimester for that termination. But secondarily, you know, I'm a mom, I've had kids and I know when you attach and you attach really quick. Um, and it, it might be that between the time that all those highly technical tests are done and the time that all the results are back that that woman might have changed her mind. And if that's so, then, then she would bring into this world a child whose genetic status would be known. And that child, when you know, born and grows up, would not, be, would not have the option to make the decision for themselves. And so there's some people that feels that that's an ethical, you know, that's just ethically a big question. So I think the bottom line here is that if you are at risk or, or you are gene expanded, you should think about pregnancy before you get pregnant. You should, you should go to, a, I don't like the word should, by the way, you, you, and you should go to a genetic counselor and figure out what all of your options are, all of them, from adoption to sterilization to surrogate parenthood, all of them, because you have lots of options to bring healthy kids into the world. All right, uh, we may only have time for one more. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, there is a question that a couple of people have asked, so we'll, we'll do that one. It's about um, phase three trials, uh, specifically F. Hoffman La Roche, am I saying that right? Global phase three clinical trial for drug development. Is there anything that patients relatives should do in order to have access to the trial results or can you give us a status on that one? Well, first of all, when top line results come out, it is gonna be screamed from the, the hilltops. Like everybody will have the results of that phase three um, trial, regardless of whether it's positive or negative. So nobody's going to hold back, trust me. It's, it's going to be shouted from the mountaintops. Um, um, Bert, are you doing that trial? Are you involved in that trial? No, we're not. There's not a North Carolina site for that trial. Um, Dr. Sung is doing it down in Alabama. Um, and uh, of course, Dr. Claussen at, at uh, Vanderbilt. But the, there's not a North Carolina site for that one. And it's the phase three... So, um, trial is already fully enrolled is my understanding. My understanding it's fully enro enrolled in the United States and it, probably worldwide too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I, I, quick? Yeah, I think we have time for, for another one. Uh, okay. 
So um, somebody asked that their spouse has refused medical dental care and she has several toothaches, broken teeth, abscesses. She has recently begun to try to brush her teeth but cannot due to motor problems. She may be getting to close to allowing a dental exam or cleaning. Any suggestions for medications to control the motor movements that would allow a dentist to perform their work? They may actually need to see an oral surgeon who can um, do some um, deep sedation in their office um, or even in the operating room. So those, there are possibilities for um, making it easier on somebody, but being able to control the situation because somebody sounds like is going to have to be in her mouth for quite a long time. Um, I think that before then, you know, standard measures for pain um, and uh, soften up her diet probably until she can get there. And I, I think it's always important to not to talk about what the problem is. What are the symptoms and what is it in what way is it hurting the person who's going to have to go through that procedure? And you can't, you can't take somebody to an oral surgeon and have them perform an extraction or really any medical care without, I mean, you can't hold them down and do this sort of stuff. It's, that's, you know, actually considered battery. So I think um, you have to, you have to somehow let that person know it's their decision but that you're very worried about how much pain they're in and how hard it is to eat and you know how difficult it is to take care of your teeth when you have so you know, such difficult pain and such such a, a tough problem. Bonnie or Bob, do you have something you want to add? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, kind of piggyback on what something that um, was already said and that's really validating the person because a lot of the time it's about control some of these behaviors are about control so that they didn't want to go to a doctor or they didn't want to brush their teeth before so if we can first validate that maybe even just going to a doctor it sounds like you're in a lot of pain there might be something that we can do to help you but you need to be okay with this so is it okay if i give the doctor a call and just see what options there are so as mary said not dragging them but being able to say number one i acknowledge that you're in pain and number two i think we can do something to make you feel a little bit better can we just can i call the doctor to make that appointment so working with that person in terms of allowing that control to come back to them and then being able to say let me give you options and don't give them a hundred options but be able to say i talked to the doctor and there's an appointment tomorrow for you I can go with you, you know, some, so and so can go with you. Who do you want to go with you? So giving viable options might get them through a door. And then as Mary said, being able to do something in terms of medically sedation or whatever it is to be able to see somebody. But I think it's about giving people control and options that really will help them to uh, stop that resistance a little bit. Okay, well, great. Thank you all so much. It looks like we're coming to an end of our time for the live portion of this conference. I know that there are still some questions out there that haven't been answered. So please continue to submit them and we will take all of the questions that have been asked and not answered yet. We will find it, get the answers for you and we will post them to the conference website. And I encourage everybody to continue um, going to this conference website. It, all of the videos from all of our expert speakers are going live as we speak. So you'll be able to watch all of their presentations. And I just wanna take one more moment to say thank you to all of our incredible experts for being here, for pioneering this new form of education conference for HD Reach. And I want you to know how much we all appreciate you. Um, and I want you to know that please go on the site and also the site is designed for you to share it with everybody and anybody you know that's in the HD community so that we can help as many people as possible with the amazing information that they've provided. Uh, next, I just wanna take a quick moment to thank our fantastic sponsors who recognize the benefits of making expert knowledge free and accessible to everyone. So Genentech, Teva, Wave, Unicure, Angels of the Abbey, Harborside Wellbeing, Terry Buner, Tony Morris, Chris and Jackie Young, please give yourselves a big hug from all of us for making this possible. And um, all right, that's it. I hope you will all fill out a survey form to let us know how we're doing. I hope everybody stays well, and I hope you will call us if you need anything. <laughs>